So thanks for joining for the first public sprint demo that we've had uh, since the 1.0 release. Um, so we want to show you kind of what we've been up to since there. So we had a slight, let's say, post 1.0 hiatus a little bit from the public demos, but we thought it was a good time to kind of um, keep everyone up to date to what we're doing. And yes, we are still doing new features after 1.0, so we're not slowing down. Um, but there was just a brief kind of uh, period where we, you know, could take a little bit of a break from the um, the quite hectic lead up to the 1.0 kind of release. So today we want to cover a few of the features. Um, so the team will be demoing uh, stuff like the changes in software management uh, to support the Comelocity Advanced Software Management um, APIs, um, minor improvements to the uploading of files. So that's for like troubleshooting configuration. Then we have a draft version of running Thin Edge as a Helm chart, so in Kubernetes. So Alvin will be presenting that. Um, then going into more um, an example of firmware updates using Rock. So we have a working example, so a new Yocto build, um, showing how that kind of works. Uh, and then looking at a few kind of community-based things to make it easier to run MTLS locally. Um, so you can have secure communication on your local broker and local HTTPS um, calls. And also looking at ex how we've kind of improved or like added additional build targets. Um, so including like risk five and ARM or ARML um, that we can also run thin edge on more um, environments or CPU architectures now. And I'll give a quick summary at the end, just a bit of sneak peek of some upcoming features because uh, there'll be some kind of interesting ones uh, to go on. OK, so we're going to start off with Rena's going to present the software management changes. So Rena, over to you. Yes, I can start. So let me share my screen. Um, this one. Yeah. yeah, and we can see it. OK, yep. Hi, I'm Rena, and I'm going to show uh, how Thingit now supports uh, Cumulus advanced a software management feature. So just to quickly, let's check the, what the Cumulosity says. So uh, previously in the legacy software management, uh, the software list is uh, managed inside managed object. Uh, but uh, now uh, Cumulosity has advanced software management. I think it's supported since 1014. Uh, so now user can uh, manage the software list via dedicated microservice. And what I want to highlight as client side and as a device side, what uh, we need to do to switch to the advanced software management, uh, first changing the endpoint where to publish software list and also adding the fragments uh, in the managed object CTR supported software types. Yep. Uh, so yeah, before so you trying the new this advanced software management feature on Thin Edge. Uh, so first, then, uh, we need to make sure that uh, your tenant is subscribed to the advanced software management microservice. This is important, otherwise it won't work. And then let's go to the Thin Edge side. So for this, we introduced two new uh, Tech Config value. The first one is Seattle Software Management API. Uh, if you so by default it's legacy, but if you change to advanced the value to advanced, and Thin Edge will switch to the endpoint, so where to report the software list. And the second one is Seattle Software Management with types. So again by default it's false, but if you switch to true, and Thin Edge will publish. Uh, or it will report uh, CHY uh, soft supported <laughs> software types. Yeah, this is, uh, oh, God, let's see here. Yeah, that is exactly this fragment. So I will show you the step by step. So, first, uh, what's going to happen? Uh, first, when the CHY software management API uh, to change to the advanced. So, pitch can big. Yeah. Uh, advanced. 
then after you change the stitch config, uh, you need to uh, restart the service of the uh, Kubernetes mapper. Uh, let's see it uh, take it's not the same way. Yep. So uh, here is actually already subscribing uh, or MQTT message inside the text device. And what you can see as a, what the difference is um, uh, here, yes. So before, I mean, in the legacy endpoint, CNH reports software list via HTTP, so actually using REST API. Uh, but after you change this config to advanced, uh, CNH start reporting software list via smart REST uh, to using this 140. And this smart REST message 140 is, uh, yeah, is setting software packages so new advanced software management API. And now the my case, so since software list is not so long, just using 140. But if so your software list is very long, so you know there is a, a limit in the Cumulosity side, uh, so how much uh, the size the size of payload limit. Uh, so if your software is, is too big, uh, we append the list using one. 41 also here it's a uh, works like a put uh yep so then the cumulus this side i mean looks same so this good list is a completely um yeah reported and if you check what is reported here so yes and actually tired yeah, since we didn't uh, uh, add the fragment of set was supported software types, so now just we switch the endpoint. That's it. Um, then now the time to change the config. The second one. This uh, we let's let's not this. And see it by um, software management with types. True. True. Okay. Then again, to the restart. Then uh, the highlights is. There's now is some somewhere inventory. Yeah, here. Okay, I found it. So now uh, I change the value to true. Um, so seeing it uh, using this JSON of MQTT endpoint to add the C to supported software types uh, to manage the object. And that means in the, for example, Postman side, if I query again, you see a C it was supported software types is now declared. And, and now the new child addition is added. This is a, a new software list, the one software list one. Yep. I think that's it that I can show you. And um, is there any question? Yeah, so maybe just to contextualize that yeah. and why do we do this? Um, so basically the advantage is, oh, I think the original, I would say problem, but like limitation was if you put the software list, a generally long list of data, if you put that on the managed object, the manage or the device manager object is always passed around a different kind of context, especially for in the, the back end for you know, establishing the MQC connection. And so it made that device very, very heavy um, because it would have like a massive chunk of, you know, a thousand kind of software packages installed. Um, and so with the advanced software management, like the microservice, which abstracts the data model now of the software packages, 
um, by putting in a child's edition, you're kind of reducing the size of the devices. Um, so it makes it a little bit easier to kind of like work with. And you can also do a little bit easier changes to that model. And you let the microservice then do, you know, add one particular software item. And then for us, uh, yeah, the side, it it's also good because we can now update the list using MQTT, which then we get like message buffering out of the box and all these kinds of nice things. Um, and then for the UI, it also means that you can actually do a software type filter based on the types that the device offers. If you don't specify that, the UI doesn't really know what it should filter, you know, what options should it present to the user. So it actually shows all software types, not the software types which are installed, everything in the software repository. Yeah, so that list then shows, um, it's kind of based on what information you publish to uh, the back end. So it's making sure that Thin Edge is also a good kind of convolocity citizen. Um, so we're making sure that we also support like the newer features, um, but we didn't want to enable it by default just yet because if people are reliant on the data model for doing whatever inventory manage object queries that they have, then you have to kind of know that you query for the software via a different manage object now, um, which might be a change in your kind of process. Um, but yeah, usually you would bake this stuff into your image and going, yes, but you want to use the new model done. Okay, thanks, Rena. Um, then I guess you can move on to your second section regarding the the small uh, improvement that we have for uh, setting file names when during uploads. Yes, uh, it's again me. So the next one to this this one will be very short demo. So our problem is uh, when we upload a file like log upload log file upload or config snapshot upload uh, when user wants to download the file from event uh, we didn't specify the file name so user just get the file name as the operation id and uh, we did a small up improvement for that so yeah so this device yeah okay so this device already has uh, some this is actually log examples and if you want to download it but this is now no longer operation id so the first one is the device name uh, external id and also log type and also this the last one is the um, yeah thing inside the command id actually this last one is the uh, same as the uh, uh, Kimonosity's operation ID. And this is for log case. And for example, also this is for config snapshot. If you want to download, yes, the file name is the same schema, but now it's no longer just a simple operation ID having more information here. Yeah. And that's it. Yeah, great, thanks. And also useful because generally, if you download something, and if you lose the context of what you downloaded, what device did it come from, um, having that kind of a little bit of, you know, a logical file name um, is useful there. Small improvement, but I think useful, <laughs> definitely. Okay, thanks, Reno. Uh, so now over to Alvin, who will be looking or de demonstrating Thin Edge running or installed via Helm chart. Yeah. Hi everyone, hope you can hear me. Uh, let me yep. share my screen actually. Yeah, okay. we can see the screen. Yeah. All right. So yeah, so today I'm going to showcase uh, uh, the next step that we have taken in our containerization journey by making Thin Edge deployable in a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, so yeah, uh, as you all already know thin edge a uh, thin edge deployment is a fairly complex deployment where there are multiple components involved there is the mosquito broker uh, there is the the mapper like velocity mapper or Azure mapper and then uh, thin edge agent and any other components so uh, to make thin edge kubernetes ready we have created the deployment definitions for all these components etc cetera, etc cetera. but 
uh, to make life easier for the end consumer. So instead of dealing with these row uh, deployment definitions directly, we have packaged them all into a Helm chart so that you can install all the Tenet's components into a Kubernetes cluster with a single command or maybe a couple of commands. And that's uh, what I'm going to uh, showcase today. So I've got a Kubernetes cluster here. So let's just have a look at it. And yeah, just the name Kubernetes service, no other nothing else deployed. Uh, and uh, the goal of this demo is to have uh, Thinets installed into this cluster and then get it connected to Cumulosity. And here I've got a Cumulosity, uh, uh, Cumulosity instance, and there are two devices. I'm going to create a third one. So you need a, to get this, uh, to get the uh, Thinets deployed. So you need a few key inputs. And uh, one of the primary inputs to this cluster is the devices, the Thinets device, the tar target Thinets devices, certificate key pair, okay? And uh, I've already got my devices certificate key pair here created. Uh, I've created it using the text cert create command, uh, but you can use whatever tooling that you use to get this pair generated. And now I need to make this, uh, this certificate key, key pair accessible to the Kubernetes cluster. And the way we do that, or expose it to the Kubernetes cluster, and the way we do that is by uh, by creating a certain, uh, creating a secret out of this uh, these files. So, so I'm going to create create a secret, a generic secret uh, named that search uh, from the contents of both these files, uh, the that certificate file and that private key file. Okay, and the secret is created. Now. Uh, you can install the Helm chart that will deploy all the uh, Thinets components. So, so I'm going to install uh, the chart named Tech Kubernetes and uh, all the deployment definitions, all the uh, the chart definitions, the templates, etc., are currently read from a local directory. I'll, I'll show you that later. Okay, and this is the other key input that you need to provide the tenant URL to which you want your uh, device to connect to. Okay. And uh, this is something that you that is defined in the in the Helm chat value. So you need to provide that. That is like a mandatory input. And that also done. So let's sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, so now everything is uh, deployed. So we've got our two key pods. Uh, one is the Mosquito pod and the TechJagent pod. So Mosquito pod is a multi-container pod. So it has both the Mosquito server and uh, the Cumulosity mapper that's running. So they are running in the same pod for some reasons. And uh, and then the Athenage agent as well. And <clears throat> the agent, the Mosquito server, so the Mosquito broker is actually exposed as a service so that uh, the other components in the cluster can access the mosquito so that they can push telemetry or uh, receive other commands and stuff like that. And there is one more service, which is the file transfer service hosted by the Thinage uh, agent. Okay, so now we've got all this set up. And now if you go and check velocity, you'll see that text gate. So this was the ID uh, from the certificate that we had created. So we've got the device created here, and now I can do operations on it. Like say, fetch a configuration from the cluster, uh, and it's working. Or say, send some telemetry data to it. So for that, I'm going to run another pod, a test pod, uh, so that I can showcase how that uh, this cluster can be accessed from another pod in the deployment. So yeah, so I'm going to run a Test pod uh, using the mosquito uh, image. Okay, so we've got that pod running, and uh, I'm going to use the mosquito command to access the cluster. So I'm going to send some telemetry data, mosquito pub, like H. So you need to specify you know, where to access the mosquito server. So that is the service endpoint for that uh, broker. So the default namespace service cluster local. I hope I have typed that right. 
and then the topic. So I'm going to send some temperature measurement. So targeted to the main device, the connection device. Slash temperature measurement. Uh, it's going to be all right. Okay, so I'm going to publish this data. I think uh, is it SVC instead of service? Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah. So, right. Okay, publish that data. And now if you go back to measurements, you will see that the measurement is here, the 15. Okay, so this is uh, this is basically uh, the short demo that I uh, wanted to show. And uh, for your reference, all of this, so the things that I showcase, like the, the Helm chart definition, everything is currently available in our repository, in our main repository under this Kubernetes directly at the root level. Um, so it's currently, it is a work in progress. So this is more like an initial draft version. And uh, yeah, there could be some rough edges, uh, but I uh, encourage you to try it out. And if any additional customization, et cetera, required, yeah. Uh, raise issues or reach out to us via our Discord channel. And yeah, once we feel that, okay, this is fairly production ready, then yeah, we can consider uh, uploading this Helm chart, making this Helm chart available via Artifact Sub or any other Helm chart repository as well. Okay, so here we've got, uh, we've got the readme and uh, all the other key definitions like the Helm chart definitions and all the uh, deployment definition templates, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, you can refer to those. So yeah, that's all I had to showcase you. So yeah, we are seeking your contributions and making this uh, better. So yeah, please yeah. try it out and. Exactly, and I think that's thing. the key point to you know reiterate. Um, we really because you know we're we'll self-professed non-Kubernetes um, experts here, um, so that's where we're really relying on you know people with Kubernetes experience to. You know, maybe how do you make the Helm chart a little bit more configurable for different aspects there? Um, so we're definitely open to suggestions and contributions. Um, so please try it out. And um, if something doesn't work how it how you think it should, you know, feel free to open up a PR for it. Um, we're happy to collaborate on this. Um, yeah, and once that's done, then we'll publish the artifact. So you know, you don't have to clone the repository, and you can install it from a, you know. Um, uh, Helm chart repository available from probably CloudSmith in the end. Um, so please um, check it out and give us feedback. Yeah, so that's all I had to show. And any questions or feedback? That's great. Um, I just have a question. I know that the sick edge is also packaging thin edge. So is that using the same um, yummy configurations or is it totally different? So I, I, I think they, it's. They, Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, go on. Um, yeah, I think it's currently different at the moment. Um, so this is still quite new. Um, so they we did kind of use a lot of their configuration to base our Kubernetes uh, deployment on. Um, so, but I, I think it kind of depends on how you want to deploy it and different kind of constructs. And do you want to include something else or have a different kind of um, pod structure? Do you want to have all as one pod and multi containers in that same pod? Um, so it really depends a, a little bit on your use case there. Um, but yes, I think that would be the goal in the end is using the public Helm chart and then pulling that in and then deploying with a simple step. But yeah, I don't think we're quite there just yet. And, and also with the deployment and about having a multi-container pod for the Mosquito and Mapper, um, this is kind of due to the Mosquito being the bridge at the moment. And there's a bit of a let's say cyclic dependency, um, which is a little bit tricky to configure. Um, however, we're kind of looking into migrating from the Mosquito Bridge functionality to push that into the mapper, um, which would enable us to decouple the two components. Because at the moment, they're very highly coupled to each other. And if you have to you know, update your mapping rules for whatever reason, then you have to kind of restart Mosquito as well as the mapper, and then it gets a little bit tricky when you try to coordinate that. Um, yeah, and have those dependencies in between those two containers. So that would definitely change in the near future. And maybe another question, um, which customers do you know are interested in deploying Synergy on Kubernetes? I had a discussion with ABB very long time back, not sure if there are any, any others. 
Yeah, there's a US customer um, at the moment, which they they created their own Helm chart because we didn't have one prior to that. Um, so I think that would that would also be like a really great contributor. If, you know, if Thin Edge hasn't done something yet, we're open to contributions to, you know, say, hey, I've done a Helm chart. If you give that to us and then we can kind of clean it up or make it generic. I mean, we're definitely um, interested in those kinds of cases. Uh, but in this case, we we created the Helm chart on our own. But yeah, there's definitely a few customers. Um, and Kubernetes seems to be a little bit more interesting. Or when we say Kubernetes, we're talking about single cluster deployments mostly. So using K3S, um, that's becoming a little bit more common on edge or thin edge kind of deployments. Um, because it does have some of the advantages, you know, with kind of like, let's say, high availability. Um, you know, depending on hardware, obviously, uh, but it has some kind of nice out of the box components and better update mechanisms rather than native containers or like, you know, Docker containers or Podman or something. Because you have that orchestrator on top, which can do, you know, container self updates and stuff like that. Um, so I think it will definitely become more and more prevalent. Thanks. OK, great. Thanks, Alvin. Then I'll take over the sharing because I think I'm doing the last little bits. Sorry, just one 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 kind of quick question for this one. Yeah, sure. uh, so like is this meant to be an example? Is it part of the like official supported stuff that we're doing about Synergy? Uh, as, as far as there's officially supported stuff, but uh, are you going to keep it maintained? Et cetera? Yeah, that's definitely the idea. So we kind of want feedback from real Kubernetes users to going, yes, we because we want some validation first before we go, hey, here's the, you know, the the container image, uh, sorry, the Helm chart, which is published, you know, um, in a central repository. Um, so we want that feedback first, and we might wait until we publish it, um, wait for the decoupling of the mosquito bridge functionality from the mapper um, because that would simplify a lot more things and make it um, the bootstrapping process a little bit easier and also a little bit cleaner um, from a design perspective. But then, you know, we'd be looking to do that in the next three months kind of thing. But yes, we are looking to make that as a, exactly like a Debian packages or RPM or APK packages, have it as a Helm chart. Because we already have public Docker images, so they're already public. Um, so writing the Helm chart is actually quite easy because you're pulling in, you know, the official image anyway. Mm -hmm. And that's really the part that you really have to maintain. Like the Helm chart, there's not too many kind of moving pieces there, as you know, once you have your basic structure. Okay, thanks. Okay, cool. Um, so looking at time, moving on to the next uh, section where we're talking about firmware updates with Rock. So we already have examples uh, using RugPy um, to do firmware updates and Raspberry Pis, uh, and also an example using Mender, the OSS variant. And so we wanted to then also support other kind of update mechanisms, so using Rock. Um, so what I'll do is I'll trigger an update because, and then kind of explain while um, it's kind of doing it, because it'll take a few minutes. Um, so here I have a Raspberry Pi 4 device. Um, you can deploy this on other devices, uh, but usually there's an integration step that you need to configure with your raw kind of setup and your Yocto uh, layers uh, to you know, set up the correct partitioning, which is kind of device dependent um, because each of the different devices then have a different kind of like um, required partition setup, whether it's you know setting which is your boot partition and stuff like that, that's kind of a little bit hardware specific uh, or manufacturer specific. So Raspberry Pi is going to require the boot partition. Um, so you could still use the Yocto layers to then build your own kind of integration with the different devices. But for our example, so I've deployed the base image. Uh, so I flash my device and that has, you know, it's a Raspberry Pi 4 and we'll have the firmware version. So it's a rock enabled image and has this version. So I can do a firmware update because I've updated the new Rock bundle. So I'm going to switch to this version. And so it's already started. And if you go to the events page, 
um, just for a little bit of traceability so you can see, hey, it's actually doing something. Um, the, the workflows then doing these transitions. So while that's doing that, let's do that. Um, so it's currently at the, so it's triggered, so they're executing. It's saying we're currently on petition A, we want to switch to petition B. So it's doing, you know, AB updates because that can be done in a reliable manner, exactly like RugPy and then the Mender stuff. We then trigger the install using, so we translated the URL that we were given from the cloud to a local URL, uh, which is using the Comlocity proxy, which makes it a really nice integration then from the Ruck level, because the Ruck doesn't need to know anything about, you know, what authentication do I need from this URL? And because it's running on the same device, um, we can do that without authentication because it's kind of a trusted source uh, running on the device. And so it's currently installing. So this will take a few minutes. So how I built or how we built this image. Um, so we have a meter tech project um, which can be used to build different Yocto images. So Yocto is just a way to build a custom um, operating system, uh, including the components that you want to include. So with our examples, um, so we have a Tedge rock here, where we basically define what layers that we want to include. So the layers are basically saying what kind of components do I want to include. And so we have a Tedge layer, where then you specify, I want to install Tedge and some common components. But because I want this image to be rock enabled, so I can do firmware updates using rock, um, we also specify the rock layer to say, please install that. So I have an image which I can then kind of do um, over the air firmware updates. So all of this kind of references, so this is the, the project to build the image. This is kind of like the glue. So if you want to actually look at the code for, you know, how do you do a integration with rock in terms of, you know, what is the workflow there to, what do I do at the different steps to install, download, and whatever? Um, so you can check out the code in the meta Tedge Yocto layer. And we can go down to the recipes. So there's a, a bit of Yocto specific knowledge, uh, like um, terminology here. So don't worry if you don't really understand what I'm, the terminology. Um, you can kind of check out the Yocto docs. But we can see here that this is the firmware update workflow, which then Edge interprets to basically say, what do I do when? So all of those steps which it's running through here are basically defined in this workflow. So you can kind of choose whatever workflow steps you want. So we followed a similar approach that we did for the other kind of integrations for RugPy and Mender. Um, so we have download and install. And you can basically tell it to, you know, call these commands at different points of time, do a restart and all this kind of stuff. Uh, so you can check the exact workflow there. Oh, so this is actually a good example of, it's actually executing a rollback. Um, so I'll have to verify why that is, but um, so that's the advantage of the um, update mechanisms. So we can see here that, so it's installed, and after you install a new petition, you need to kind of do a device reboot to then switch to the other petition. We get a bit of like information about how many bytes were downloaded. So just using normal Linux commands and looking at the interface um, where, so let me just do that, where we've come back from the, so we've switched to the new petition. So it's continued in the new um, workflow. It's checking the health of the new petition, but then something's gone wrong in the verify step. I'm going, oh, we've switched back now to the previous petition. Um, I'm gathering the, the times probably a little bit offset because when you switch petitions, depending on your device, generally the time gets reset back to 1970 or whatever your fake hardware clock is set at. Uh, so sometimes you're, Diffs in time, maybe the um, uh, the time hasn't been synced 100% um, yet. So coming back here, this is like, so it's failed. So go here, it's failed, but the rollback was successful. So going, okay, I still have a functioning device, which is great, because otherwise um, you'd be a little bit hard pressed uh, to justify that to your stakeholders. Um, but 
you know, it should still, or maybe I'll do that. It's probably quicker. So it's still reacting and I still have a responsive device as I did before. So then I can kind of, you know, maybe see what actually happens. Wait, do I, so I could, if I, you know, have SSH access, I could have a poke around in the log files. If I remember where they are. So I believe it'll be the workflow log. And then can kind of have a, a look kind of what happened. To then verify. Uh, so the, the I'm sorry, where is it here? Uh, so it failed to test the commonality connection. So the verify step failed and that's why it triggered. So the verify step failed. So in my workflow, if you don't validate the new petition, um, then it will switch back. So because part of the verification is making sure that in the new image, thin edge is working correctly, because if it's not, then you have probably a problem because you can't then communicate to the device. So that's failed. Um, yeah, due to Mosquito probably not being up and functioning at that point in time. Um, so like an improvement would be, you know, maybe retry that step uh, and give Mosquito a little bit more time before rolling back. But still a good example because you need to test all these rollback mechanisms to make sure they really work. Um, so that's actually a good example. And then we can still have a log which kind of shows us, you know, what happened. Um, so we can then assess, oh, okay, I need to be a little bit more lenient with my verify step, give it a little bit more time before I, you know, assert, yes, we need to do a rollback. Um, but that's definitely the advantage of having a, um, a robust AV update. So I think I probably could have also retrieved the, I oh know I haven't configured the logs here. Um, yeah, so for that example, you can check out the Yocto log to look at the specifics. Um, so if you wanted to check out the verify step, you know, what does it actually do? You can check it's just doing a, so it's looking for all the mappers and making sure that they're all healthy. Uh, and then if not, fail and go back to the, the rollback step. So you can see here that we're just doing it once and that's it. So we're not even like doing a retry or anything. So it's a little bit naive. Um, but yeah, so you can build all that stuff today. Um, that doesn't need a new version of Thin Edge. So that works with the, the current version, which is 1.0.1. Uh, so there wasn't any kind of Thin Edge code changes uh, to support that. It's more about the integration of additional steps. Um, so that's all ready to use today. But just be aware you do need to have a bit of Yocto knowledge to build your own things. Uh, but if you just follow the um, Thin Edge documentation on how to build some Yocto stuff, uh, that should be enough to get you going. So if you can just do Yocto. So if you go to the next instructions, that's actually where we've updated the rock example. Yeah, so we put references to rock and then you can use the meta touch project to actually build your thing. Okay, moving on to the next point. Uh, so I probably won't do an example, but more just to, to kind of show the setup. Uh, so we have additional tooling, so an extension of the Go CFY CLI plugin, um, or where I have a plugin um, for Thin Edge, which is to help the setup of your device to enable MTLS for your local communication. So what does that mean? So Thin Edge, can run on a main device, but it also supports um, opening up that MQC broker running on the main device to other child devices. And so to when you open something up, so it's available from another device in the network, you generally want to then also use certificate-based communication uh, to enable secure communication from the child device to the main device. So we've supported this since 1.0, I believe. Um, however, setting up the certificate or like even creating the certificates and making sure they live in the right areas is a little bit tricky if you don't have experience with this. 
Um, so what we've kind of extended is, so if we go to yeah, here, so as part of our, let me make that a little bit bigger, Tedge command, so I need to see my screen. So we have as part of like the, oh, sorry, I'm on the device at the moment. Part of the Tedge command, so we have a bootstrapping command, which is then used to, or like primary, primarily used uh, to generate the device certificate using a local CA on your dev, uh, development machine. So instead of like going for a self-signed certificate, um, but we've extended this to also do the bootstrapping in terms of enabling MTLS on the main device and also connecting a child device to it. So if you look at the examples, um, we can bootstrap a device and then you can specify the MTLS flag to say, please enable MTLS on these devices. Um, and then if you want to bootstrap your child device, so the child device connects to the main device using certificates, it, all you need to run is this command where you specify what child device do you want to bootstrap. You want to use MTLS and then it needs to know what device should I then be connecting to locally in the network. So what I've already done in the setup, so this is my main device is Raspberry Pi 5 and I've actually connected a Raspberry Pi 0 2 as a child device so running Tedge agent and only Tedge agent. That's actually, so this device here, um, this is then connected to the main device using certificates. So maybe I can just quickly show just so I'm, you know, you can believe me. So let's just connect locally. And the easiest way to kind of see this, I'm just going to do Rust log trace and just do a Tedge uh, MQC sub. So this is connecting to the local bridge, uh, sorry, the local uh, broker on the main device. So this IP address, and we could see it's using then a TLS handshake. And in the end, it's using TLS 1.3 and then using certificates to then communicate with that. So we have secure encrypted communication then from the child device to the main device. So the output isn't pretty when you're doing the, the commands because there's a lot of like SSH commands running in the background. Uh, but however, we just want to demonstrate it, make it easier for users to kind of do the setup and then we can fi um, fine tune, you know, the output. So it's a little bit more readable um, and a little bit quicker and stuff like that. Okay, then looking at the time, uh, jump to a brief description. So we've extended the number of targets that we actually build for. So most notably, We've gone from four targets that we support to I think 10 in the end, um, but two have a caveat on them. Um, so a lot of these are targets like the most notable ones. So we support AML now. So if you're running an older device um, with like, I believe an ARM 9 even now, um, you should be able to also install FinEdge on it. Um, we can install FinEdge on x86 or like the i686 um, processors. Uh, so, you know, 32 bit Intel processors basically. Um, so that now works. And also RISC V. So, we're also after feedback for, you know, if you find something that doesn't work properly. Um, so, we're still kind of integrating that into the whole system tests. Um, so we still want to get feedback before we say, yes, this is an officially supported device um, because the RISC-V processes are a little bit trickier to kind of um, integrate and less readily available. However, the big push with RISC-V and why we wanted to kind of support it or like add it to the mix is because it's a open source variant of basically ARM processes. So it's still reduced set processes. So it has like the advantage of using kind of like the the same reason why ARM architecture is so successful. Risk five is a very similar architecture, um, but it's basically no licensing fee on that. So a lot of um, devices coming out of China have Risk five processes. Um, so it'll be slowly kind of ramping up, but it's still a little bit of the bleeding edge in terms of like building images for it and stuff like that. The other uh, 
fun targets that we did. So you can actually now install Thin Edge using Homebrew on Mac OS. Um, so we're not saying we want to support this in terms of we don't want to have a product saying, hey, I want to launch on Mac OS. That doesn't really make sense. But where it's useful is if you're playing around with Thin Edge and kind of want to run it locally to test out a few kind of functionality uh, on your own Mac machine, like for development purposes, then it's quite e um, useful to kind of easily pull in. And that's what I have set up here. So this is locally on my Mac. I can even do, oops, if I write the correct command, I have a local MQ, uh, Mosquito broker running, and then I can connect to that broker using the Tedge CLI commands. I can even start the agent here on the left-hand side. So all running natively on Mac. Um, yeah, so that's also available. Um, we don't really have any official documentation for that um, apart from the Homebrew Tedge formula. Um, but you can check it out under our Thin Edge organization to kind of have a look to see how to use it. But it should be fairly easy to install, and then you can kind of see just how to run the different components to then do your own kind of troubleshooting. Um, and we will actually be adding a brew software management plugin. Uh, so I do have one running on my machine. Uh, so even if I can publish a software list and I get the software list for the homebrew packages that I've already installed on my machine. Um, so yeah, if you look at that. So these are all the homebrew packages. So it just kind of validates that we can run in a lot of different environments just to make it easier to consume uh, as well. And also you can then test, you know, custom SM plugins. You may be playing around with um, natively on your Mac. Okay, the last point. So a little bit of sneak peek of stuff either that we're doing or other features that we didn't demo. Um, so we do have a new CLI command for Tedge, uh, which can be used to generate a certificate signing request. Um, so if you already have a PKI and then you want to generate the CSR without doing a, you know, I wouldn't say complex OpenSSL command, but a hard to remember OpenSSL command, uh, then we can also generate that from Tedge CLI now. Um, and then submit that to whatever PKI you have um, to get your LEAF certificate for the device. But what we're currently working on, um, I would say there's two massive features that we're kind of working on and they're a, uh, already in progress. So the big one being the software uh, supporting device profiles, where you can combine software, firmware configuration um, in one operation. Uh, so we've been working on the foundation of changing or like supporting, you know, calling sub workflows from our workflow backend. Uh, which is basically the mechanism which we use to execute things when an operation request is received. So we've extended that. Um, so now we're working on the connection from the cloud and you know defining the device profile data structure to then react to that. But we already have a kind of rough um, proof of concept that confirms that our workflow mechanism works, which is great. Um, so in the coming months, we should be able to then incorporate that in the product. Another big one, which is kind of alluded to regarding the Kubernetes thing. Um, so we're looking to move the MQT bridge functionality from Mosquito to the mapper. Um, why? A, we decouple these two components a little bit, um, which makes the configuration aspect a little bit easier, but also it enable, uh, enables us to do a little bit more fine-grained control over the whole bridge. Um, so for example, we can change the subscriptions that we have without having to restart Mosquito, which is currently uh, you have to restart Mosquito to then subscribe to new things from the cloud. So because it's then in the process that we have control in, uh, control over, we can then do these kinds of things. Uh, but we can also get more insight into the connectivity status. So, you know, how often are we disconnected from the network um, and then build a, you know, an availability kind of percentage, um, how stable the connection is. Uh, and do a lot of like nicer things like that because we're in control of the bridge ourselves. And then we simplify the bootstrapping process 
um, because it's self-contained in the mapper. So if you want to bootstrap the mapper uh, or like the connection to the cloud, you just restart the associated mapper and you don't need to restart the whole mosquito, which is when you're doing maybe three connections. So you have AWS, Azure and uh, Comelocity. Then it doesn't really make sense restarting the MQT broker just if you need to restart the Comelocity connection because then that affects all the connections. Um, so yeah, though it, it, we're still, there's a lot of validation required to kind of move from that, um, but we think the features that we can offer in the future will definitely uh, be worthwhile. And also small kind of usability improvement. Um, we have a already in progress um, working on automatically uploading like log files uh, when a command fails or like operation fails. Uh, so you don't need to request, you know, the related configuration file or like log file when something fails, so you can see what's going on easily without having to, you know, issue another operation. Great. So we're seven minutes over time. Do we have, uh, does anyone have any additional questions? So if not, then thanks for attending. And as always, uh, you can reach out to us on Discord, um, create issues on GitHub, um, and then to discuss new features or, or general questions that were generally quite uh, responsive there. Great, then thanks for attending and see you next time.